Good evening. Uh, I'm Paul Webley. Uh, I'm the director of uh, SOAS. I'd like to welcome you all in the audience tonight, particularly those of you who've travelled uh, a long way to be here, and to Professor Lutz Martin's parents. I'm told they're here somewhere. Excellent. Uh, wife, friends, and uh, colleagues. I did ask Lutz. I said, uh, was, it, where is, was it parents used to seeing him in this academic performance? He said, yes. They always used to come to my gigs when I was younger. <laughs> so uh, We have guests from uh, many places here tonight. Uh, some of people have travelled a long way to be here. And we really appreciate you taking the trouble. So as inaugurals are something uh, special. They're a, they're a ceremony. They're a rite de passage for the speaker. And the rite de passage element sometimes makes speakers, even very experienced professors, a bit nervous. I have to say Lutz has shown no signs of nerves whatsoever. He's relishing it. He's looking forward to it. He's going to deliver you a wonderful inaugural. No nerves at all. Uh, it's also an enjoyable and intellectual event for the whole SOAS community. Now, just some housekeeping beforehand. Uh, there's no fire drill. would be a bit unorthodox to have a fire drill on, a, on an evening. So if you hear a fire alarm... Yes, you should panic. No, you shouldn't panic, but you should go out the fire exits, OK? And the other thing you should do is to turn off your mobile phones. So I'll just do that myself, because otherwise I always forget. There we are. Finally learning how to do it. Good. Now, I'm very pleased to preside over this inaugural lecture. It's the ninth one of the 2012-13 uh, inaugural lecture series. I've read just one of Lutz's articles. It was on the meaning of money, which is an area I myself do research in. I enjoyed it greatly. Uh, and I'm sure that the erudition, but also the accessibility uh, that was on display in that article will also be on display this evening with his inaugural lecture on linguistic variation, language contact, and the new comparative Bantu. Now, Professor Trevor Marchant will introduce Professor Martin tonight. Now, Trevor as one of our own, really needs no introduction at all. But I will say just a couple of things. Uh, Trevor qualified and practiced architecture. I think everyone should do that first. Uh, and later received a PhD in anthropology from uh, SAIS, where he's now a professor. He's conducted field work with masons in Arabia and West Africa. And he's also worked with woodworkers and furniture makers in the UK. He's actually a very talented uh, furniture maker himself, a man of uh, many parts. He's the author of uh, many books and a co-producer of a documentary film, Future of Mud. He's also recently run a half marathon. Um, well, I'm always very impressed when people do that. So, Trevor will do the introductions. And the vote of thanks will be given by Professor Thilo Schardenberg from Leiden University. Now, he's a professor of uh, African linguistics. He's a particular interest in languages that are influenced by Swahili, He's published extensively. I had a look at the list, and it was so long, I had to stop. But vast amounts of things, including books on Swahili morphology. And I must confess my ignorance as a psychologist, languages that I had not heard of. Um, Umbundu, Namweze, is that right? Uh, and a number of other things. He's had a major impact on the field of African linguistics, and we're very grateful for him to be here tonight. So for Trevor and Professor Schardenberg, thank you very much indeed for being part of this event. Finally, and I say this now just so you know at the end, there's a reception in the Brunei suite uh, for some uh, wine and some canapes, so do come up after the vote of thanks. So to introduce Professor Lutz Martin, I will now pass over to Professor Martin. Over to you, Trevor. Thank you, Paul. It's really a great pleasure and an honor to introduce Professor Lutz Martin on this very special evening. I've known Lutz for nearly two decades now. We met here at SOAS when Lutz was doing an MA in linguistics and I was starting my doctoral studies in anthropology. At that time, linguistics and anthropology shared the fifth floor of the Cyril Phillips building and there was ample opportunity for staff and students of both disciplines to interact with one another. That synergy, I think, formed the basis of our enduring friendship and our academic relationship. Lutz's intense curiosity about the nature of human cognition and communication continues to be an inspiration for me and for many other colleagues and students in the university. Over the years, my thinking about, human, about the human mind has been textured by structural linguistics and especially by Lutz's research and writing on the theory of dynamic syntax. 
In turn, Lutz's open-mindedness to anthropology has informed his practical field method for collecting linguistic data, and his theoretical analyses emphasize the importance of context. Context really in the cognitive act of interpreting and generating dialogue. Collaborative interests eventually led to our convening a course in anthropology and linguistics. This drew students from both departments and reforged historic and productive links between the two disciplines. I much look forward to the opportunity once again working closely with Lutz. I also have to tell you that I cherish the memory of our student days together. Like all research students, we were busy reading, writing MPhil reports, then dissertation chapters, preparing for supervisory meetings, working as teaching assistants, and struggling to make ends meet in London. Though Lutz was the only student I knew at the time, <laughs> driving a vintage Mercedes Benz. <laughs> Never quite got that one. Nevertheless, there seemed to be more time. There was more time to eat lunch together in the SOAS refectory, to discuss the modularity of mind, or debate the structure of concepts, or the function of symbols over a coffee or an all-day breakfast at the long-gone Greek cafe on now fashionable Store Street. A quick evening pint often turned to two or more, finishing with the last one at the late night pub across from the Mount Pleasant Postal Station. After graduation, we were both fortunate to secure teaching posts at SOAS and the exchange of ideas, readings, and greetings continues, but perhaps less frequently than we would both like if it weren't for other commitments that work and life bring. Lutz's many friends and colleagues here this evening know that as his career flourishes and his reputation as a linguist and Africanist grows, it becomes ever more difficult to track him down. We've become reliant on his automatic email reply to tell us whether he's presently a visiting scholar in Brazil or China, <laughs> conducting field work somewhere in Africa, or giving a lecture in Dublin, Leiden, or Berlin to an audience of formal linguists, Africanists, or Bantuists. Staying true to my own training as an anthropologist, I sent Lutz a questionnaire while preparing this introductory talk. Some of the answers he sent back from Zambia merely confirmed or reminded me about Lutz's past training, his continuing aims, and his great passion for his work as a researcher, teacher, and administrator. Lutz's enthusiasm for his subject is infectious. He remains one of the most popular teachers in SOAS and a very skillful supervisor. His students leave not only with sound training in their discipline, but they also, along the way, discover a true pleasure and personal satisfaction in learning. Lutz has also served as the Associate Dean for Learning and Teaching in his faculty, and later as the Head of Department for Linguistics. He approached these administrative tasks with a sense of duty, responsibility, and efficiency, but also with enjoyment and good humor and nature, which makes him the highly valued colleague he is here at SOAS. Other of Lutz's responses to my questionnaire filled the lacunae in my knowledge about his future plans and aspirations and helped me to gain a clearer overall picture of his diverse interests and expertise and how these connect to one another. And this is what he will do for us this evening in his inaugural talk. There are far too many scholarly and personal achievements to share with you in the short time I have left, but in my remaining minutes, I hope to offer you a glimpse into Lutz's impressive trajectory to becoming a SOAS professor of general and African linguistics. The cornerstones of Lutz's scholarly foundations were already in place during his undergraduate program at the university of his lovely native Hamburg. There he studied English language, literature, and culture, along with philosophy and African studies. Lutz grew quickly interested in language as an object of study, adopting a structural perspective to his, to his analysis of German and English, and notably, that structuralist theory formed the basis for his later dynamic syntax work. At Hamburg, he also began studying Swahili, which, as many of you know, he now teaches. And he continues to conduct field-based uh, field research in East Africa and has published extensively on the language, including his colloquial Swahili course book, co-authored with Donovan McGrath. Lutz's move into Swahili at the undergraduate level introduced him to African languages more generally, and provided a foray into another of his fields of expertise, namely comparative linguistics. 
Lutz's long connection with SOAS began with an MA in linguistics followed by a PhD conducted under the brilliant and energetic supervision of Professor Ruth Kempson. It was during these years that he worked on the theory of dynamic syntax, modeling the complex cognitive actions involved in dialogue interpretation. Importantly, dynamic syntax shifts the emphasis from competence to performance, or in Gilbert Ryle's term, terms, from knowing that to knowing how. This groundbreaking research was carried out with Ruth Kempson, Ronnie Kahn, and others, resulting in a plethora of publications, including a sole-authored monograph at the Syntax Pragmatics Interface, which is grounded in Lutz's PhD research and presents an absorbing exploration of verbal underspecification and concept formation, as well as the weighty co-authored monograph, The Dynamics of Language, which has provided me and scholars of other disciplines, including music, philosophy, and cognitive studies, with endless food for thought. Lutz started in 1999 as a lecturer in his home department of linguistics. After spending two years as a prestigious Millennium Research Fellow, he was appointed lecturer, then senior lecturer in Southern African languages. This appointment reflected his rapidly expanding interest in scholarship in African languages, including impressively Swahili, Bemba, Hadiya, Luganda, Zulu, Herero, Luguru, Kiluguru, and other Eastern, Central, and Southern African languages. Lutz's comparative study of Bantu languages meticulously investigates variation in morphological and syntactic structure, and his analyses consider how such variation is, re is reflected in different communicative practices, and what drives who to say what to whom and why. I think these are really fascinating questions to ask. In his remarkable number of publications, many co-authored with his wife Nancy Kula, also a talented linguist, Lutz demonstrated acute intellectual agility by combining theoretical linguistics with comparative analysis. While exploring the cognitive structures of online language interpretation, Lutz has paid thoughtful, thoughtful attention to the communicative setting and its role in interpreting and generating utterance. Discovering variation or an unexpected usage or structure, he told me, keeps me excited about working with primary language data. His long-term goals are ambitious. Lutz seeks to employ his vast knowledge of African languages, their structure, function, and use, to better understand human language more generally. He is motivated by the daunting challenge to one day explain the uniformity of language with a theory that accommodates linguistic variation, change, and the setting of everyday dialogue. No small task. I end with a quote from our recent email exchange that I think captures the deep, almost primordial questions that have driven Lutz from an early date and that will continue to steer his exploration in the years ahead. Language is so pervasive in our lives. It's always around us and everyone can do it, so it's often taken for granted. But the more you look at language, the clearer it becomes how structured and complex it is and it provides one of the most valuable clues we have to understanding our cognitive and cultural selves. I now hand over to the man himself, Professor Lutz Martin. I'm not wearing the hat so you can see my hair. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, Paul. Thank you much, Trevor, for the, for the kind words. The vintage Mercedes, after long considerations and thoughts, I've decided to sell it. It still exists in my parental garage. I think I've now changed my mind. <laughs> I'll keep it. <laughs> um, okay. Um, thank you all very much for coming. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's a great pleasure to see so many friendly faces. Um, let me see that I can get my own slides up. Uh -uh. Oh, I see. Oh, sorry, I didn't do that myself. Okay, um, linguistic variation, language contact, and the new comparative Bantu. I have, I fear, too many slides. I see how it goes. Um, <laughs> um, but it is, it's, it's, it's topics which are close to my heart, which reflects very much what, what Trevor said. 
in his very kind introduction. Um, and I thought it's important to share that with you. It also has quite a lot of data, but you can't really do these things without data. So again, I, I think it was the right decision. And then there will be the wine reception afterwards, so we can then see whether that was... <laughs> Never mind. Okay, um, I'm going to briefly start with an overview of the main points. Then I, I, I start historically and talk about how people have compared Bantu languages and then talk a bit about Bantu trees. That's a particular theoretical approach to comparing Bantu languages. Then, and this, the one and two, that's sort of a historical background. The third part, the morphosyntactic variation, that's sort of my own narrative. That's, that's you know, collaborative work, but that's where my own work comes in maybe more. Then mediated convergence, that's new. That's really special for tonight. I thought of it just yesterday. Um, so, <laughs> but it's great, I really believe in it, and, and, and you know, <laughs> I'm excited about it. Um, and then I have a few conclusions at the end. Um, before I start the votes of thanks, I want to thank all my teachers. You know, being, being an academic has something slightly generational, so you have teachers and then you have students, and you hope to pass something on from the teacher to the students. So thanks to my teachers, thanks to my students, my PhD students, master's students, students who go to my classes, Dynamic Syntax, the Bantu language, language in Africa, I, I find teaching extremely motivating. A lot of stuff which, which is here tonight actually comes from interaction with students over the years. Um, collaborators and co-authors in academia, you never walk alone. These are people I've worked with in the past and there's many more, um, but I just wanted to share um, the names with some of them. And then also family and friends and unfortunately I ran out of space on this slide, but <laughs> also thanks to them. Um, Okay, overview and main points. Comparative linguistics provide key, provides key insights into how languages work. I, that's, that's why I think it's exciting. Again, it goes back to what, what Trevor was saying. Um, recent advances in Bantu comparative linguistics result from better description of Bantu languages. That's important. We know much more now about Bantu language than we used 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, but also from development of linguistic theories such as analysis of morphosyntactic variation and language contact. And it's that interface between better descriptions and theoretically informed questions, which I think makes Bantu studies and linguistics in general um, very exciting at the moment. Um, language contact, people have shown, um, leads to the similarity of languages. Um, it's sometimes called convergence coming together. Um, but sometimes convergence is found between languages which are not in direct contact. And this is the mediated convergence I'm so proud of. And I'm going to show you what, the, what that means. Um, I have examples from Bemba Zulu and Swahili, and I hope at the end of the evening you get a better sense of why I think this is, this is really important to do. Um, okay, this sort of historical background, if you like, comparing Bantu languages. This is a map of Africa, and the shaded parts are the, are the Niger Congo languages, the orange, orange shaded part. That's where Bantu languages are spoken, so it's a huge part geographically of Africa. Um, there are about 300 to 500 Bantu languages. They're spoken by 240 million speakers off and on. Counting languages and counting speakers is a very, very difficult enterprise. So these are just ballpark figures, really. Um, spoken 27 countries. And on the map, you can see there's, there's a fraction of, of named Bantu languages in geographic space. Um, historically, the early description of Bantu languages we have come from, there's, there's a bunch of Swahili words in the writing of Ibn Battuta. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, we have Portuguese sources um, from the 15th and 17th century, and then <coughs> various 19th century sources. Um, William Blake, Wilhelm Blake is important for coining the term Bantu as the name for the family. It's a root meaning people in many Bantu languages, and then he thought that's a useful designation for the overall group. Um, Meinhof um, then reconstructed the first proto-Bantu in, in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, Guthrie from here, um, Meinhof, sorry, Meinhof, by the way, he, his, his um, place of work was Hamburg, so that's, that's where I'm from, so I always feel very close to Meinhof. Um, and Guthrie, of course, comes from here, so I feel very close to Guthrie as well, um, because he was, he was at SOAS and spent like a long time of his life working here, um, and is famous for his um, uh, classification of Bantu into geographical zones, zones north, south, east, um, that sort of thing. Um, uh, after, after the war, there was uh, work in Belgium um, and, and Leiden, actually, where, where Thilo is from, by a, a linguist, Eichel Marysen, who, who looked more at the grammar. And then further on, his group developed construction and uh, 
uh, currently there's computation and statistic, statistic methods. I come back to that a bit later on, but it's not life-changingly important. Um, this is Ibn Battuta, or at least, you know, it's a picture which could be Ibn Battuta because we actually have no idea what he looked like. <laughs> um, but he is sort of, you know, one of the, one of the first people uh, we know something about Bantu languages. This is Wilhelm Blick, a very important person. He was one of the few trained linguists in this setup. Uh, this is one of them before and after shots. So we went out, out to the Cape Town, <laughs> well-groomed, and then he worked on Bantu languages and actually Khoisan languages. Um, this is Meinhof, a priest by profession, very severe looking Protestant priest, of course, um, with a big beard. This is Guthrie, he looks a bit like me. With the <laughs> um, <laughs> um, also not a linguist, he's a trained engineer. Um, and they, you can see it's all white middle class male. Um, and then I, I wanted to show this picture. This is more contemporary. These are colleagues I work with, Yukura Kavari from Namibia in the middle, Herman Batibo, one of the big, big heavyweights in African linguistics, really. And just there, sliding into the picture, Rose Litzol, a Bantu syntactician. Um, so it sort of shows that, hey, it's no longer white, obviously, but it's also a much more friendly environment than it maybe used to be in the past. Maybe it was just a photo opportunity, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but but it's, you know, and I mean, I'm not, I'm not joking. It is important that your colleagues are friendly and you have an environment which support what you're doing. And African linguistics certainly does that. Um, okay, let us go to trees. One a striking thing about Bantu languages is that if you compare them, if you look at them, you find very easily similarities. So the Swahili word for three is tatu, and the Bemba word for three is also tatu. The same for farming or cultivating, lima, lima, the word for drum, ngoma in both languages. And if there are differences, like the word for name, is, it's Jina in Swahili, Ishina in Bemba, or the word for fireplace, Jiko in Swahili, Ishiku in Bemba, you'll see that the differences are A, slight, and B, more importantly, they're systematic. So every J in, in Swahili corresponds to Sh in Bemba. And for comparative linguists, that's really important because on, based on lexical and phonological evidence, uh, <clears throat> that is, by word comparison and sound correspondences, like the Swahili J or J, or J and the Bemba Sh, um, <clears throat> that's how you can, can try to establish relationship between the languages involved. Um, and one typical theoretical approach, which goes back to the early 19th century, actually earlier than that, um, is um, in, seen in the quote by William Marston, who never was in Africa, I think, but he was living in London, but he knew Africans, so he knew about reports and stories. And he comments on the relation between Western and Eastern Bantu languages, that is Bantu language from Kenya and Tanzania and from the Congo, that the instances of resemblance and words expressing the simplest ideas May be, thought of sufficient, may, may be thought sufficient to warrant belief that the nations by whom they are employed must, at a remote period, have been more intimately connected. So the, the analysis here is essentially historical. What he says is, these languages are similar, let's explain that, and the explanation is, in the past, there used to be one language, and that was the language from which both developed. Um, it's a classic model of language comparison, which assumes that languages develop over time like branches of a tree. So, so essentially, Marston copied that from, from the revelation of Indo-European. Um, so William Jones, 30, 40 years before that, had the observation with Latin and Greek and Sanskrit. Latin and Greek and Sanskrit are really, really similar. Therefore, they must in the past be related, as in there was one speaker community, and that is the birth of Indo-European. So in a sense, Marston sort of copies that into the African context. Um, Harry Johnston in the 1920s has that, has that graphically, so he has a little map where he thinks this is development of Bantu languages, and you can see it's a sort of a tree. It's a bit sort of, you know, grown wildly, but, um, but, but the idea is that the, the origin comes from the, uh, the shaded point just under Lake Chad, and then you know, the languages spread southwards and, and westwards. Um, a more modern version is a, is a very comprehensive study by, by Bastien Coupé and Mann, Michael Mann, again, he, he was here at SOAS, um, comparing about 250 languages based on a hundred word comparison. So essentially they sent word lists out to schools and other contexts, collecting words and then comparing them, and then uh, having a, a fairly big computer program for the time to get this tree. A modern version based on the same, um, same data is from Holden and Grange. You can see with the coloring here that they try to relate it to geographical space. But the problem with that is that Bantu trees, and not only Bantu trees, any languages, assume that languages change and become more different over time. That is, they assume divergence. 
and that's true, but it's only partly true. Um, this is partly borne out, but borne out, but languages may become more similar over time as well. That is, there's divergence and convergence um, due to language contact in bi or multilingual situations, and that's quite common in Africa. Many speakers of Bantu languages speak more than one Bantu language, and through that, you get effects that the languages become more similar, and that, that's a, a theme I'm going to develop um, further. This is a quote from the Bastan um, et al. Study to the confusion of the tree model shared innovation is independent of ancestry. The most we can say of two languages that display a number of innovations in common is that they have shared a period of linguistic community. But whether that's, that's historic ancestry or being in, in contact, that is left open. Um, and from that, we at some stage decided that different data and different models may address this problem. That, I mean, it's not only us, there's lots of other people who, who travel the same path, but for the particular study I have, that comes from here, and that's the morphosyntactic variation. It comes from a, from a project we had at the beginning of the millennium, um, an HSC funded project with a number of collaborators, Ruth Kempson and, and I were working on it, and Tlachla Twala, who's now back in Witzwatersrand, Anna McCormick, Udo Klein, and Miriam, who's there were the students at the time. Um, and as part of that study, it was a study on Romans and Bantu, so there were other results, but as part of that study, we did a comparative study of Bantu morphous syntactic variation. That is, we looked at grammar rather than words, not lexicon, but morphology, syntax, word order. Um, we had 20 parameters we looked at for 20 languages, and qualitative results and quantitative results. I, I won't go into much detail, but there's one thing I want to show you, and this is this one here. This is a comparison between five languages of the sample, Swahili, Bemba, Chicheva, Siswati, and Herero, and I have a map of that right now. Um, and it has on the left-hand side numbered 1 to 14, and there's A's and B's, which you don't need to worry about. Um, these are the particular grammatical structures found in these languages. It's to do with object marking and relative clauses. The details don't matter, but it means that we can say for, for each language, is this feature present in the language, yes or no? And that's the yes or no we see here. Now, if we, if we calculate the shared values, we get percentages numbers. So, the similarity between Chichewa and, Chichewa and Swahili is 73%. That is, they share 73% of these features. Um, the relationship between Bemba and Swahili is 67, slightly lower. Um, projected on a map, and I'm sorry about the resolution, <clears throat> that what, what that looks like is that there's two, two groups of languages, as you, if you like. There's one group, which is this one here, Swahili, Bemba, and Chichewa. They share over 65 of structural relations. So this is a, a, this is a, a percentage, 67% actually and more. On the other hand, Herero and Siswati are below 60 and sometimes way below 60. They're in the 40s and 50s. Um, lots of disclaimers, two small data, blah, two small data set, um, not enough parameters. This, this might not be indicative, but, but it's interesting and it made us think, you know, what might be behind that? And we came up with a contact-related explanation um, in, in two flavors, really. One is the perif peripheral languages, Herero and Siswati, that's the blue ones here, Herero and Siswati, um, have a history of contact with Khoisan languages. So they are in contact with languages which are very different from Bantu, and therefore may be slightly different. But they are not used much by speakers of other languages. So if you're a Herero speaker, you, you tend to be a first language Herero speaker. You may speak another language, but there are not many people who, who speaks another, speak another language and then learn Herero as a second language. And that's true also for Siswati. Bemba, Chichewa, and Swahili, that's the orange ones which are closely related, they are not in direct contact. So a direct contact explanation doesn't quite work. But they are all lingua francas with a high number of second language speakers who usually speak another Bantu language as first language. So from that, we, we thought maybe the structural similarity between Bemba, Chichewa, and Swahili may result from the use of lingua, as lingua franca and hence from language contact with other Bantu languages, not direct contact, but indirect contact with little languages spoken in the respective areas. And that is what I mean by indirect or mediated contact. Um, so, in other words, although not in direct contact, lingua franca has become more similar due to indirect contact or mediate convergence. And I have, I have created little graphics to illustrate that maybe more clearly. Um, Swahili and Bemba are blue, and they are not in contact, so they don't touch each other. But they are spoken in areas where there are other languages. These are the little orange ones, and I haven't given them names, but I could name them. In fact, I'll name them a bit later. Um, I just call them A, B, C, D, la, la, la. These are Bantu languages spoken in the area where Swahili and Bemba are spoken. Now, Swahili and Bemba are in contact with the other Bantu languages, not in direct contact, but in contact with the other languages. Through that contact, they become more similar, not only to the little orange ones at the bottom, but also to each other. 
So even though there is no direct vertical relation, horizontal relationship, through similar vertical relationships, you get an effect of a, of a horizontal one. So the question then is, can we find evidence for indirect convergence due to influence from first languages or local languages on lingua francas? Any guesses? <laughs> well, it would be a stupid lecture if I then said, no, there is no evidence. So yes, we can. <laughs> Okay, I have two examples there. Actually, there's lots of more examples. It was very painful to decide what to, what to put in and what to leave out. But I have two examples. Um, one is diminutive classes 12, 13, uh, that will become clear in a moment, K and 2, and the other is the habitual marker AG. Um, okay, mediated convergence. I'm going to look at Swahili, I'm going to look at Bemba, I'm going to look at Zulu. Zulu just a bit, um, for the Zulu, I'm a bit sad. There is really more to be said about Zulu, but I don't think, I actually have no idea. Can anybody stop me? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> well, there is the wine reception. I quite realize that. Um, OK. Um, not, not too much about Zulu. Um, not too much about Bemba either, but I need Bemba as my second lingua franca. But I'm going to concentrate on Swahili, and I'm going to look at contact, contact phenomena between Swahili and smaller local Tanzanian languages, like Kagulu, Chindamba, Nyamwezi and Ruri. All these are community languages in, in, in Tanzania. The vast majority of speakers of these languages speak Swahili as a second language, and I'm going to show with these two examples that the Swahili spoken by second language speakers changes in contrast to what is called standard Swahili, and becomes not only more similar to the little languages Chindamba, Kagulu, Nyamwezi, Ruri, but also more similar to Bemba, in which it is not in direct contact. Eh? Indirect contact, mediated convergence. Okay, um, good. Um, uh, convergence effects in colloquial Swahili as opposed to standard Swahili. The first example, diminutive noun classes K and 2 have been lost in standard Swahili, but are reintroduced into colloquial Swahili through contact with Tanzanian home languages. The second one, the habitual marker AG has been lost in standard Swahili, but is reintroduced into colloquial Swahili through contact with Tanzanian home languages. The argument is exactly the same. Um, it's the examples which are different. Ah, this, this is a little homage to, to my friend Donovan because this is from the uh, cover of our colloquial Swahili books. I'm very, very fond of that little picture. Um, but I've used it here to briefly so talk a bit about Swahili. Swahili origin spoken along the East African coast from, uh, from Somalia down to Mozambique. Now a lingua franca of Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, parts of the DRC and Mozambique. And the majority of Swahili speakers are bi or multilingual in Swahili and another Bantu language as their first a home language or other language. And actually, as an aside, that's changing towards Swahili a bit. So there is, I, I say that later. There is a bit of urgency in describing these situations and describing the small Tanzanian and other Southern African languages because there's quite a bit of shift towards Swahili and, and other bigger languages in other contexts. Okay, first example. This is the Swahili noun class system. Noun classes are like gender systems in French or German. So German has three genders, Swahili has 11. It's actually not that hard to learn, but it looks impressive. And you can tell by the prefix. So class one has m, mm, and the plural is was. So sorry, these are, tend to be singular plural pairs. So it's, it's one person, several people. Um, class three, m, mm, mti, the tree, miti trees. Five, six, jicho, macho. 7, 8, kitabu, vitabu, 9, 10, goman, goman. They are the same forms, but you can tell from agreement patterns that they're different. Um, class 11, ukuta. Um, that's great, that's the standard Swahili. Um, what has happened historically that coastland standard Swahili has lost another pair of classes, which are called 12, 13, and the numbering is entirely conventional. There is no, no reason to it. Um, these classes are, are ka and tu, and are used to make things small, they are diminutive classes. And Swahili replaces that with the use of class 7, 8 um, for making things small. However, in colloquial mainland Swahili, CAR 2, 12, 13 have reappeared, um, reflecting influence from home languages. Um, the, an overview about noun classes in Bantu, this is a comparative table. PB here, that's proto-Bantu, the reconstructed ancient language. But what I'm after maybe is Bemba, um, uh, which we've seen, Swati and Swahili are the same in this respect. Standard Swahili, Ndamba and Nyamwezi, these are two little Tanzanian home languages. And what I'm after is class 12, 13. It's reconstructed for Proto Bantu, that's fair enough. It's there in Bemba, Katsu. It's gone in Zulu. It's gone in standard Swahili, but it's there in Ndamba and Nyamwezi. And I'm saying that, that because it's there in Ndamba and Nyamwezi and other languages like it, it has reappeared in colloquial Swahili, making it more similar to Bemba. Um, 
The, the reconstruction is, this is from the word, work from Achille Merson, that a stem normally appearing in a given pair of classes could be used in class 12 and 13 with diminutive meaning, that just means you can use these classes to make things small. And we can see that in Bemba, a person is umuntu, people are abantu, small person akantu, little people utuntu. So we have umu, aba, class one, two, for person and people, and then the same stem with class 12, 13, aka utu, to make people small. Um, Zulu has lost that completely, so that's, that's one case study, if you like, and invented a completely new form, namely an ending ana, from a word historically meaning child. Imbuzi, the goat, imbuzana, small goat, ifu, the cloud, ifana, the small cloud, and umfula, the river, umfundlana, um, the small river. So that's Zulu, and that's fine. Swahili, as I said, has, uses class seven, so ndege is the bird in class nine, a small bird, ki dege in class seven. But many Bantu, in Tanzanian Bantu languages retain class 12, 13. Chindamba and Kamwezi. Chindamba, um, Lipiki, the tree, Kapiki, a small tree. Nyamwezi, um, that's one, one of Tilo's work. Um, um, Nguana, the child, Kana, a small child. So there you can see the Ka prefix. Now, colloquial Maynard Swahili um, um, reintroduces class 12 and maybe to a lesser extent 13 to mark diminutive standards. Well, we've seen that mtoto, a small uh, child, watoto, children, ki toto, small child, vi toto, small children, standard Swahili, class 7, 8. Now, in contrast, colloquial Swahili, mtoto, watoto, the same, ka toto, tu toto, that's the class 12, 13, which you find in mainland colloquial Swahili. Another example, standard Swahili, kila mto anahitaji kishamba chake, every person needs his own small field. Um, it's, it's a textbook example. I'm not quite sure what the context for that is. Um, but ki shamba is a small field. Chake is the agreeing. The colloquial Swahili version is ki lamuto anahitachi ka shamba kake. So you can see that's the only difference, but it's, it's noticeable. Um, in colloquial Swahili, ka and tu are widespread in the spoken language. They are not used much in literary language, except maybe in dialogues. They are found in newspapers and other media, including social media, and they're often used with special pragmatic effects, such as emphasis or irony. Um, and a lot of the examples I have here, there's an there's a, um, electronic Swahili corpus, so I checked the novels, and you, you, I didn't find a single instance except for this one, and this one is from a dialogue. And it's a bit like we know that from, from say, Shakespeare. Sh if, you, if you want to look at colloquial forms, you look at the, at the dialogue of you know, poor people or colloquial people, they speak like what Shakespeare thought normal people spoke, and then you can wonder whether that's true. But, but that's where you get sort of colloquial data. So this one here is, Kunashida Gali, what's the problem? A kashida, aha, kashida kadogo hivi, kadogo sana, very small problem, not even to worry about. Um, aha, nina hitaji hati ya kuzaliva, I need a birth certificate. And that's actually not quite such a small problem, because in this particular context, it, it, the, the addressee Mbaye can't quite just issue the birth certificate. So this is, the, the meaning here is, or the, the pragmatic effect is to make it, the, the example smaller than it actually is. The next example, Finland, Kanji Kadogo Ambako Leo Kana Ongoza Kwa Utengene Zahaji Wasimu Mkononi Hapo Olimwengu. Finland, a tiny country which today is leading at the production of mobile phones in the world. Now, Finland is not a tiny country in terms of space, but the context here is that this is an, an article congratulating the DRC to introduce a Swahili language academy. And the point is that even a small country like Finland, which has its own language, Finnish, and there are so few people, but they still maintain Finnish literacy, Finnish books. They are leading in, in the production of its Nokia, I guess, uh, of mobile, mobile phones. Um, so, so that's why the emphasis on a small country, if even a small country like Finland can do it, then we, big countries in Africa, surely should be able to use our own languages for economic development. Aha. Nilsikia akisema kuwa haka karushwa kakweto, ala haka karushwa kakweto ni kitogo sana. I heard him say, this little bit of corruption we have, it's so small. <laughs> it's not even worth talking about. <laughs> there was a big issue with corruption in Tanzania um, a couple of years ago, as you can see. Um, and so, so you can see the, the rhetoric effect here. The next one, Mimi Dafsi Sewezi Kumishimo Rais Ali Chegoliba na Kakikundu Kadogo Kawananshi. I personally cannot respect a president who's been elected by such a tiny little group of people. And again, it's, it's the politics and the rhetoric behind it. Um, okay, you find it on, in social, social um, um, media sites. So this is a little chat site. Um, and this is, this is Eddie Murphy, the American comedian. 
Yeah? Okay, good. Um, and it's, it's a comment on Eddie Murphy, who is 51, apparently, having a new girlfriend who is 28. And then the, the caption of the, this contributor, who is called Babylon, uh, he writes, Mze Eddie Murphy, who in a katota kodogut with his small child or small girlfriend. And then the reply of Buji Buji, who is a more experienced blogger actually, he says, Miaka ishirini nanane nim totum dogo. Ah, ah, let's get real. So he said, 28 is not a small child. So she is maybe younger, but she is not like a little baby. But it's interesting that he now uses the class 3 standard Swahili agreement, shifting away from the class 12. Um, in descriptive literature, this is a grammar from, from very distinguished linguists at the University of Dar es Salaam. It's a grammar of standard, of standard Swahili. And they write under noun classes, we have you know, these sort of noun classes, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to 14. But they include these ones here, ka, double star, two double star. So they acknowledge that ka and two are there, but they star it. And by the double star, they mean um, words which are marked by two stars result from Bantu influence and have not yet been universally accepted as standard Swahili, even though some people are using them. So there's a clear, a clear understanding that the forms are used, they are not accepted standard Swahili, and it's also very clear that they come from, from second language influence. Um, so what that means is that mainland, mainland colloquial Swahili, mainly used as a second language, reintroduces Bantu features, in this case diminutive classes ka and tu, which had been lost in coastland standard Swahili. Through this, colloquial Swahili has become more similar to Tanzanian home languages, like Chindamba and Yamwezi. That's, that's a standard conversion case, so they become more similar because they're in contact. But also to Bemba, with which it is not in contact. So that is the mediated convergence through the influence of the small Tanzanian languages. Colloquial Swahili changes and becomes more similar to Bemba, which has retained the, the K2 class 12, 13 markers. Um, the second example, um, the habitual aga, um, due to influence, influence from other Bantu languages, colloquial Swahili uses an aspectual, habitual suffix ag, which has historically been lost in Swahili. So there used to be an, an, a reconstructed um, um, uh, aspectual suffix ag, imperfective, repetitive, habitual, um, which has been lost in Swahili, so it goes to zero. Um, and in, 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 in addressing that, if you like, coastland standard Swahili has, has developed a new habitual marker who based on a form ni ku. It doesn't terribly matter where that's coming from. So you get sentences like in standard Swahili, wewe hula wapi, where do you usually eat? Um, and the who there is the habitual marker. It means like every day, you know, it's, it's like if it's a campus conversation, which mensa do you go to? Um, however, many Tanzanian Bantu languages retain the habitual ag. Um, so this is, this is an example from Gagulu of the work of Marlene Petzel from, from Gothenburg, um, um, which is Haka um, Idjaga, this is the arc, come when the Kwawiki, she came once per week, and we can see the habitual mark with the, with the arc, which is lost in Swahili. Um, Chiruri, this is from David Masamba, who's one of the co-authors of, of the Green Grammar we've just seen. Eni um, Guraga, I buy regularly, and again, um, we see the, the arc. Um, now, in colloquial uh, mainland Swahili, we have reintroduction of arcs, so a sentence which, where do you usually eat, which in standard Swahili would have the who, comes out as una kulaga wapi, ag. Um, and this is presumably due to the reintroduction of the morphological habitual marker ag, originally, originally lost due to language change, by second language speakers of cognate Bantu languages. So it's the same story, just a different example. Um, like ka and tu, ag is found mainly in, in the spoken language. It's a marker of mainland non-standard Swahili. Um, and therefore, it can be used as a marker of social linguistic non-conformity and innovation. Um, and as such, it's a great candidate for youth language. So, so people are quite aware of, of these non-standard forms. Um, and this is one of them. And one way where that shows is in a a fairly popular Tanzanian song called Hakunaga by an artist called Sumali. It was the, the song of the year of Radio 1 of Dar es Salaam in 2011 or something. I didn't know it either, but I'm slightly out of touch with the youth movement. Um, but if you're a young person, you would probably know, a young Tanzanian person, you would probably know about it. But what is interesting is that the song is called Hakunaga, but there is actually, isn't a word like Hakunaga, not even in colloquial Swahili. There is a word Hakuna, which you probably have come across in Hakuna Matata, 
which, yeah, the jung jungle book, is it? Mm. So hakuna means there isn't. So hakuna matata means no problem. So hakuna is there, so what Sumali does, he adds this ag, meaninglessness, if you like, so that it's not an habitual, but as a marker of speaking non-standard subordinate Swahili. Um, and he does that not only for the hakuna, but it goes through, through quite a number of the lyrics. So this is one, one stanza of four, four lines. Kosa lakuni ombam sahama hakunaga, you don't ask me for forgiveness, and there, there is nothing between us. Ilana um, ombam samaha to party shaga, but I'm asking for forgiveness just so to clear the air. Nawe umini vumilia sana, mi mi or mi sija onaga, you have persevered with me, you have put up with me, you have let this relationship continue with me in a way I have not seen. Another girl would already have ditched me. Um, so it's a little love song, and he's very happy that his, his girlfriend is very enduring. But see what's happening. It's aga, 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 aga. So, ah, so it rhymes nicely. Um, but like hakunaga, ishaga isn't really a good Swahili word either. So isha is to finish. So to party, to party kisha isha means that, that, you know, that, that we can finish our discord. Um, sija ona is a wonderful form. Sija onaga, again, it's not an habitual. This is, this is purely a marker of you know, colloquialness. And this is, the Moaga is slightly different. That's a lexical word meaning um, to say farewell. Um, I briefly want to, want to show that to you because it's a nice video as well, if this one works. Um, and what we want to look at, let me just briefly say, um, it's, it's one, one minute 10 to one minute 27. I'm not sure whether you can see that very well. And I'm not sure whether you can hear it either. Oh, it starts with Zulu for some reason, never mind. <laughs> Ah, this is the girlfriend. Mm. You can see her? Shaga. Okay. Um, now go away. Um, yes. So you can see the the artistic value in these forms, and that people are really aware really of it. So there's a lot of social linguistic um, package in there. Um, let me conclude by saying that the Swahili examples show the reintroduction. Uh, of morphosyntactic features from second language speakers into colloquial Swahili. They often carry specific pragmatic or social linguistic functions, so it's not, it's not an accident quite that they are used the way they're used, especially the second examples really show that A, speakers are aware of it, and they use it in a very, very, you know, if not conscious, but certainly informed social linguistic um, fashion. Um, they also have a distinct semantic contribution, and that's something, again, it would be nice to spend a bit more time on. The, the, the particular examples I've chosen, the diminutive, and the, and the habitual, they are not isolated in Swahili. The, we have similar examples from Lozi in Western Zambia, where class 12, 13 got lost and got reintroduced, and that's, that's fairly well documented from local languages. Um, and we have, we have habitual aga um, in Kikongo, again, in a similar situation where it got lost for some reason and then reintroduced to second language speakers. So it might be that it's to do with this particular semantics that, that we have these effects. And one thing which would be nice to look at in the future, not, not only for those, but, well, also for those, is whether there is recurrence of these semantics not only in Bantu, but in other African or indeed non-African languages. Um, and I come back to that maybe after these two points. Um, the result is that colloquial Swahili becomes more similar to Tanzanian home languages through language contact as well as to other Bantu languages such as Bemba, 
through indirect mediated convergence. So there's no direct contact, but still they become similar. And that's for, for, for classification, really a complicated issue because the tree method really can't deal with that. So that's why, why it's interesting from a contact perspective. What is also interesting is that there has been quite a bit of discussion about linguistic areas and, and uh, linguistic geographic areas showing convergence effects. And it would be very interesting to see whether these effects are also found in other big lingua francas like, like Hindi, Urdu, like Indonesian, Arabic, and whether we have similar effects which what we see here. Um, okay, the case study shows more general developments, um, different approaches to comparing, comparing Bantu languages, such as historic comparative classification, divergence, and trees. That it's, it's, you know, I don't want to say that, that this is a wrong method. It's just one of many methods, and we have to see that we get a, a good picture by using different methods. Um, contact within and without Bantu, and indirect contact, and then also dialectal and social variation. That, that's important. So, so for all these examples, we need to have a good understanding of colloquial spoken Swahili in addition to literary standard Swahili. Um, this whole is based on better and timely descriptions of more Bantu languages. And I mentioned that before. A lot of the languages I've used here are moderately endangered up to even more than moderately endangered. So to get good descriptions is important. And of course, comparative work like this, you can only do if you have sufficient data from enough languages in order to draw this wider picture. Um, and it's, it's based on better understanding of morphosyntactic variation, multilingualism, language contact, and social linguistic variables. So this is where, where our, our theoretical advances really have helped to understand better you know, what we, how we can best interpret the situation we have in Bantu. Um, I think with that I stop and say thank you and then hand over to Tilo, I guess. Yeah, very good, thank you very much. Spectabilis, Professor Martin Lutz, colleagues and friends. It is with, with great pleasure, yet not without nervousness, that I stand here before you about to deliver the traditional vote of thanks. My delight is easy to explain. Having been invited to fill this venerable slot is a great honor for which I'm most grateful to you, Lutz, and to SOAS. But whence the tension? It is not lack of familiarity. This is the 17th SOAS inaugural lecture ceremony that I have the pleasure of witnessing, thanks to YouTube. <laughs> is it my dress then, this Calvinist robe that makes me feel like a crow among woodpeckers? <laughs> While even the proverbial blackbird has a yellow beak and amber rings around his eyes to brighten his appearance. Rather not. And though I won't deny that I'm a bit jealous of your colorful gowns, hats, and hoods, I know that Lutz and I agree that black is beautiful. <laughs> no, it is the title of his lecture that makes me ill at ease. Or rather, the last phrase of it, the new comparative Bantu, and within that phrase, more specifically, the adjective new. This, to me, sounds like the announcement of a change of paradigm. Inaugural lectures are an excellent opportunity to place oneself in the field and to announce to a wider academic audience which way one is heading oneself and in which new direction one will try to lead the field. Being, if anything, definitely a representative of old comparative Bantu, Lutz, in fact, calls on me to reflect on where I myself and my generation have come to the end of the road. I found at least some of Lutz's points of criticism in his review of a thick book with the admittedly pretentious title, The Bantu Languages. He notes, there are, I, I quote, there are at least two major thematic omissions. There's insufficient discussion of theoretically informed work on Bantu, in particular on Bantu syntax and semantics, and of sociolinguistic and anthropological aspects of Bantu languages. And then he continues, I think these omissions are not accidental. Rather, they seem to follow from an editorial decision, essentially to restrict the scope of the book to, alongside, other, alongside descriptive work, work in the historical comparative tradition, which, of course, is the context in which the editors work. This is a pity, as this narrow scope does no service to the study of Bantu languages." End of quote. 
Uh, I was not the editor, right? Um, <laughs> the points Lutz makes have a much wider application than merely to the book under review. If they did, it would be out of place to cite them here. I admit that scholars of Bantu languages of my generation, myself included, have paid less attention to social, cultural, and applied aspects than to description and comparison. And within descriptive and comparative Bantu studies, some topics have dominated, others have been underexposed. Descriptions of Bantu languages were primarily concerned with morphology and, after 1968, the year of the sound pattern of English, also with phonology. Syntax and semantics were definitely less looked at. I have phrased this slightly different from the way Lutz did, who points to a deficiency in theoretically informed work in Bantu. It seems to me in this respect, Bantu phonologists generally have a much better record than most Bantu syntacticians who were few and far between. In fact, Bantu phonology and morphophonology have often been on the forefront of new developments in phonological theory. Just think of Larry Hyman, Charles Kitterberth, John Goldsmith, could mere mothers. post firthian concepts of tone and stress owe everything to the analysis and ever more refined reanalyses of Bantu languages, starting with Tsonga, Zulu, and Ganda. Why was our interest so ill-balanced? I would like to suggest that the preference for phonology and morphology over syntax and semantics may be due, at least in part, to our less than perfect knowledge of our object languages. For the non-speaker or semi-speaker linguist, it is difficult, but possible, to arrive at a good, insightful, and quite complete description of the sound inventory and the morpho morphological paradigms of a language. For syntax and semantics, this is much harder. From my student days in Hamburg, I remember the professor's tale about fieldwork, who made up, in this fieldwork, who had made up a, a test piece of data and asked him, the speaker, can you say this and this? The answer, which was not meant to be funny or frivolous, was, yes, you can, but we don't. <laughs> the anecdote reveals limitations of data elicitation. Pache. Fortunately, there are other ways open to the non-native or semi-speaker to arrive at new insights. Um, the study of texts and transcripts of speech. Lutz is a master of using and analyzing such resources as we have had just had the pleasure to observe when he dis in some of the examples on some of the slides when he discussed the reintroduction of the ka diminutive and the ak habitual into colloquial varieties of Swahili. There's another reason why Bantu is in other descriptive and comparative linguists in Europe, or better, I should say, in Europe and Great Britain, uh, and even some of our colleagues in the United States have kept a safe distance from dominant syntactic theory and vice versa. Early transformational grammar, talking about way, way back, huh, um, did not look favorably at the descriptive study of variation, which was seen as not adding much to our understanding of linguistic theory, each language in itself being a perfect incarnation of human language. There was quite some bitterness around in both directions. This is largely past time now. As we can see here today, both sides have been winners. Linguistic theory has itself become immensely varied, and language variation is seen as a treasure grove. Lutz is undeniably theoretically well-informed, to use an understatement, with a firm base in dynamic syntax. On several occasions, I've heard Lutz present the basics of dynamic syntax to Africanist audiences, like myself, utterly uninformed about the model, and I've admired its usefulness and his elegance in shedding fresh light on, for example, the far-reaching uh, implications of agreement with conjoined noun phrases that we have in Bantu. Excellent. Turning to comparative linguistics, the subject of the first part of this in inaugural lecture, I would like to distinguish two goals. One's goal may be either to study language change or history, or one's goal may be to understand human language faculty. The two goals meet when your aim is to study language evolution. And sometimes, you can use the same data to pursue both goals, and I think that is what we have witnessed today. Thank you. Please allow me, as a representative of the old school, to add a short remark on the comparative method. 
differed from what some people assume, both within and outside the field, constructing trees is not the only or main objective of historical comparative linguistics. Trees can be interpreted as an image of ancestry, depicting ever-growing diversity and splits, but subclassification is not the core element of the classical comparative method and has been but a minor concern of the great Bantu scholars whose pictures we have seen, Blake, Mind of Guthrie, and I must add Mason, and Mason, the fourth one, without a picture. Michael Mann, whose name we've heard, a student of uh, Guthrie's, stated quite clearly in the book where, uh, from, uh, that his Bantu trees, of which we have seen a sample, do not represent change over time. And maybe I can ask later, um, I've often been wondering about the significance of the SOAS logo. Um, <laughs> the approximation, the approximately 500 Bantu languages are one of the two largest closely knit groups of related languages in the world, sharing much of their complex morphology, but arranging and rearranging it in ever new patterns. As such, as we have seen today, they form a wonderful, exciting natural laboratory, laboratory of language variation. It is precisely this variation and the social constellations that feed it that are at the center of the new comparative linguistics and Bantu studies. The Bantu universe offers a unique chance to see the dynamics of human language at work. We need both kinds of linguistic work, theory-driven and general descriptive, including but not restricted to pioneering documentation of endangered and or understudied languages, small and large. We are grateful to SOAS for its long-standing and continuing commitment to both kinds of linguistic research. The better we know our object languages, the more fruitful our research is likely to be. This is where language teaching and language learning comes in. And again, we must be grateful to the world's leading institution for the study of Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. Swahili, as we have seen today, though being Africa's best and most widely studied Bantu language, still has a lot to offer to the researcher. This institution, so us, may be proud of a long chain of excellent Swahili scholars and teachers, and I name just one, Ethel Ashton, writer of, in 1944, of uh, Swahili grammar of unfa unfading fame and authority, but also co-author of A Grammar of Luganda, 1954. We are fortunate in knowing that Lutz is going to continue this great tradition. So, I've said my thanks for the invitation. I want to congratulate SOAS for appointing an accomplished scholar as a professor of African and general, and general linguistics. Three, I thank you all for coming here this evening to celebrate this event. Most importantly, however, I would like you all to join me in thanking Professor Lutz Martin for his illuminated and illuminating lecture on comparative Bantu studies. May there be many more to come. Thank you. Thank you.